morning, good afternoon, everybody. We've got another exciting Holden Safari fireside chat uh, for you today. And today's a special day because our partners in uh, Kenya who look after uh, all of our safaris in East Africa are actually out in the wilds of Kenya in the Samburu National Park. So let me introduce to you again, if you haven't already met her, Annabella Francescan, who's the uh, Hello. and uh, founder of uh, Manyaga Safaris based in Nairobi. And she is, as I said, deep in the wilds of Kenya, up in the northern part of Kenya, north of Nairobi, where not many clients uh, 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 are brave enough to venture. But uh, today we've got a very special guest that Annabelle is going to introduce to you who will allay any fears of heading north and excite you about the opportunities of being on safari in the north. So Annabella, welcome to the Fireside Chat. And would you please introduce the special guest you have for us today? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Samburu Land. Okay, we're here with Tom Lesage, who is the CEO, the director of Samburu Reserve and all the conservancies in the area. And when we talk about conservancies, you're talking about areas of around 1,000 square kilometers, etc. I mean, it's just huge. The whole area is immense. And Tom runs all of these extremely efficiently to the point where we basically no longer have any poaching here, etc., etc. Today we have been on this incredible expedition with Tom tracking for rhinos up in the Serra Conservancy in the same area. So I won't go on too long because uh, you really need to speak to Tom and not me. <laughs> okay, over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Annabella, and welcome, uh, Tom. Uh, it's so nice of you to give us your time uh, i gather i imagine you must be very busy trying to manage the park without uh, clients contributing to the uh, uh, cost of trying to keep the uh, park fresh and alive and away from poachers etc etc so welcome uh, one tom and would you uh, let me ask first of all if you would introduce yourself tell us where you are um, and uh, your current position if you would Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Lesarge, uh, the Samburu County Government Director in charge of Samburu National Game Reserve. Uh, currently, we are at Samburu Intrepids, which is one of the camps in Samburu National Game Reserve, uh, with um, uh, the Maniago team from Nairobi, and uh, we are having a time of our lifetimes. Oh, perfect. Tell me why. Why are you having the time of your lifetime? Are those people from Manyaga being a problem? Are they leading you astray, Tom? What do they do? <laughs> uh, they are simply uh, inspiring me uh, in the work that I'm doing uh, to protect the natural uh, spaces that we have in Samburu for our wildlife. And uh, we've been out and about watching elephants and uh, lots of other species of animals. Uh, including the black rhino, uh, which was decimated completely in the 70s and 80s uh, around this area. But now having been introduced by uh, my community uh, into one of the community conservancies, uh, we were able to track those rhin uh, rhinos today and had a fantastic time with them. Fantastic. So Tom, before we get into the specifics of the park, uh, would you please... Um, enlighten our viewers, our listeners, uh, as to your background, because you're from the area. You're not coming from another part of Kenya, as I understand it. You, you are actually from that part. Would you please just tell us a little bit about your people, where you come from, and how you've ended up in the position you're in? Uh, yes, I was born um, not too far away from uh, this uh, game reserve, uh, some few kilometers west of the game reserve, uh, and uh, lived most of my life uh, just north of the game reserve, um, and schooled them, um, uh, schooled in Samburu, uh, primary school, secondary school, but went on to university in a different part of Kenya. 
uh, but came back to work with my community uh, and initially started uh, with uh, getting my people uh, to do a different kind of conservation of wildlife from the ones that they have traditionally known. And that's why ultimately I have been appointed by the Samburu County government to run the Samburu National uh, Game Reserve. Uh, and of course, still help my community in managing the conservancies uh, that they run. That's, that's a wonderful, um, that's a wonderful uh, explanation of your background, Tom. And it's so nice to hear that you've gone back to the community where you were born and raised because so many people once they uh, uh, receive a university education, go on elsewhere. So it's very nice. Would you please explain again? I think most people will only think when they think of Kenya about the Maasai. Now, you from Samburu, and we must orientate our viewers, that is north of Nairobi, as opposed to the Mara, which is south, southwest, and Amboseli, which is southeast. So you are north of Nairobi in the Samburu. Please explain the cultural differences of the people in Samburu versus down in the Maasai Mara, where most clients tend to go. Right. Um, the Samburu people and the Maasai people are basically one people. Uh, we all migrated into what is today called Kenya uh, along the Nile Valley. Uh, you know, from about uh, Egypt uh, or Sudan and came into what is called Kenya. Uh, and due to a severe drought, uh, we splintered into different groups and the Samburu tended to remain in the north, that's north of Mount Kenya. But the rest of the Ma groups migrated down to the south uh, into currently uh, southern um, Kenya. Uh, and up to central Tanzania. But basically, we are one people. We have the same language, the same cultural practices, uh, but we are simply um, are separated uh, in space and time. And that's why the Samburu are seen as a distinct group from the rest of the Maasai. But basically, we are one people. That's very nice. So uh, they are your brethren. And I assume the traditions and the customs are the same, but the wildlife is completely uh, uh, different in many ways, isn't it? So would you please uh, yep. introduce the wildlife that you have up in Samburu and why and how it's different to what people, uh, uh, travelers might see when they go to the, Ma the Masai Mara and Amboseli? Right. Um... The uh, Samburu uh, is an arid zone uh, of Kenya. The northern part of Kenya is generally uh, semi-arid and desert, uh, but Samburu itself is arid uh, and semi-arid. So there are animals that are special to this part of the country, uh, which are endemic to northern Kenya. That's only found in northern Kenya uh, and southern Ethiopia. Uh, such as the endangered Gravis uh, zebra, which is bigger than the common zebra that's found down uh, in the south in the Masai Mara and Amboseli. Uh, we also have um, a giraffe, the reticulated giraffe, which is different from the Masai giraffe that's found down in the south. Uh, we have the Besa oryx, uh, which is a desert animal. It's an antelope with very long uh, lyre-like horns. Uh, and only found uh, in uh, dry areas. Uh, the Gerenuk, which is an antelope with a very long neck, and in fact the term Gerenuk comes from the Somali language and means long-necked uh, gazelle. Uh, we also have the Somali ostrich, uh, and it's called Somali because this general uh, area is called the Somali region uh, by uh, taxonomists uh, who name animals uh, and that's different from the uh, common ostrich or the Maasai ostrich that is found in uh, southern Kenya. Uh, but we also have uh, other animals that are found down in the south like lion, leopard, cheetah, elephants, uh, buffaloes and many others uh, including the Nile crocodile in the Wasunyuro River, which is the lifeline of the reserve out here. 
Wow. So that sounds um, a lot for people to take in, uh, Tom, which is a nice way to lead into my next question. So uh, post-COVID, Tom, what we're, what we're promoting here at Holden Safaris, uh, in partnership with Manyago Safaris, is what we call the Stay Longer, Dive Deeper Safari. And instead of trying to do the whole of Kenya in one safari in 10 days, two nights, two nights, two nights, what we're saying is you just stay, you just choose one area and you stay there maybe in two lodges, five nights, five nights. So if that was the case, and we had to send somebody to the Samburu area, that whole area, the Northern Range, what would you, because I know part of your background is uh, being a safari guide and also managing safari camps, what would you be advising somebody to do if they had 10 days and they wanted to spend that at different camps in the northern range? So Samburu, all the way up to the north. What would you recommend? What would they do and what would they see? And why should they do it? Right. Um, the first stop uh, out of Nairobi would be Samburu National Game Reserve uh, because it's uh, the southern boundary of the Samburu territory. Uh, so that would be a very a good introduction to Samburu. Uh, that's the largest Samburu. Uh, and of course, we have uh, lots of wildlife in there. Uh, so lots of game drives uh, to be done within the game reserve. Uh, but um, Samburu is not just a uh, Samburu National Game Reserve. Um, I already mentioned that we have lots of community conservancies, uh, and uh, these community conservancies are home to lots of animals because uh, Samburu National Reserve, put together with those uh, community conservancies, is the larger ecosystem that all these animals uh, use. And uh, elephants move in and out, gravis zebra move in and out, and all other species of animals move in and out of Samburu National Game Reserve into the community conservancies, and from the community conservancies into um, the, um, the game reserve. Um, we have um, the uh, black rhino, uh, which was resident in Samburu in very big numbers but was decimated by poachers in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but of course, some few were rescued and taken to some safe havens uh, in other parts of the country. But um, we came together as the Samburu people and said the rhinos belong to us. They've always been here and we want them back and want to take care of them. And in 2015, we introduced 10 rhino, that's one male and then um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, five um, uh, males and uh, five females and all the females have given birth uh, now we have uh, 17 um, rhinos all together in an area that we purposely uh, fenced off uh, to promote in situ conservation of black rhino and it's not a small area considering that we are pastoral nomadic people who need lots of pasture for our people uh, we first of 107 square uh, kilometers uh, for the in-situ management and conservation of black rhino. So uh, we do rhino tracking in uh, that uh, rhino sanctuary. And it's a fantastic thing to do that we did uh, uh, today uh, with the Maniago team. Uh, you know, walking through the bushes and with the game rangers in them and tracking those rhinos and seeing them out in the wild and experiencing that on foot, not in a vehicle. Uh, so that is a whole day experience that somebody can take. Um, we also have um, issues to do with uh, elephants um, abandoning uh, babies uh, due to um, uh, poaching sometimes. Uh, sometimes babies fall into wells that uh, the personal nomadic people um, make. Uh, but the same personal nomadic people rescue those babies. And sometimes the mothers don't come back. So some community among the Samburu came together and said they will be taking care of such babies. So we have a um, baby elephant uh, sanctuary uh, just north of the reserve, about two hours drive. 
uh, that uh, rescues, rehabilitates, and rewilds uh, baby elephants. Uh, and, you know, our business really is to ensure that those babies uh, lead um, normal lives in the wild, ultimately. And uh, it is a very big experience going out there to see the local keepers feed those baby elephants and take care of them, nurse them just like their mothers would do, uh, but of course in a human way. Uh, and um, it is a fantastic experience for every person that uh, stays here to go and uh, do. Uh, that's called the Reteti uh, Elephant Sanctuary. And uh, it is definitely um, an experience. Uh, but uh, we also impart uh, that sense of responsibility of conservation in our young people. And uh, we engage our guests in going through schools and uh, hearing from the children themselves uh, what they think about conservation of wildlife because they are the future of wildlife conservation in this country and among the Samburu people. Uh, so that's another experience going out to local schools and learning about that. Uh, we have several uh, organizations that run um, um, research programs uh, like research on elephants. Elephants, of course, are endangered. Uh, the gravy zebra is endangered, and we have people uh, running uh, programs uh, on research. Uh, we have uh, lions that are also endangered, and we have people who do that research. And we get those specialists to come out with guests and go out specifically to look at those specific species and impart that knowledge in the guests you know, bring that uh, whole um, research uh, into life to those guests within the reserve and outside the reserve. Uh, our culture, of course, is also a very big aspect and uh, the Samburu people are tenaciously clinging to their culture uh, against all odds of westernization. And therefore, uh, they lead their lives as they have always led uh, for millennia. And therefore, it is a fantastic experience to go out, get uh, together with them. The women do what the women do. The men do what the men do. Uh, go out dancing with them. Uh, you know, eat their food if you like. Uh, and just get to learn something about the Samburu people because that culture is extremely rich. And there's a lot that you can get uh, from the Samburu. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in there. And personally, I'm a writer. Uh, I document the Samburu culture and I've read, written a book on proverbs of the Samburu and that's pure uh, uh, wisdom uh, that people from other cultures can come and learn. Uh, we have um, fantastic um, uh, landscapes out here, you know, towering hills and we therefore also take people out uh, mountaineering on some hills, some uh, sacred uh, mountains. Uh, that is more than exercise and at the same time a cultural experience because the Samburu people believe that their supreme being resides in high places such as those mountains and do their sacrifices and prayers up there and guests can partake in such uh, things or simply go up there and see what happens and uh, there will be uh, guides out there to bring that whole experience uh, to life. Uh, those who are daring uh, can go rock climbing on those mountains, you know, paragliding, and, um, you know, uh, whatever kind of adventure that they would like to do out there. Goodness me, Tom. Uh, yes. So a, a number of comments. First of all, the Zamburu people are extraordinarily lucky to have you as their ambassador. I'm sold. Uh, I'm coming on the next Kenya Airways direct flight from New York to Nairobi, uh, jumping into the Manyago vehicle and driving immediately to Samburu. That sounds uh, fascinating. And 10 days uh, is not enough. We've got to spend a month there to do all the things. Absolutely not. So that is very... Go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot that uh, you can do. Yes, and please uh, do come out here and I'll be your personal guide. Whoa, Tom, we're gonna to take you up on that. But I have a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, just a comment. Um, I was particularly taken with the, um, 
activity you said can be done with black rhinos. There are not many places that I can think of where you can track black rhinos on foot. So that is a very, very unique and special experience uh, to bring to the attention of our guests. So thank you for telling us that. The other thing is you mentioned community conservations. Would you explain the difference between a community conservation and a national park? Are they one and the same? Are they different? Uh, how, how, do, how does it work? They are the same and different. They are the same because they all um, conserve the wildlife that is on our land, the Samburu land. Uh, but the N National Game Reserve is directly managed by the county government of Samburu. Uh, but the community conservancies are managed and run by councils of elders uh, chosen by the people in their different regions within Samburu. And therefore, they are the, the ones that run the affairs of those uh, uh, sanctuaries, uh, recruit uh, game rangers to take care of the wildlife, and therefore all the revenue that comes from that, if there is any, goes directly to the community, and it is therefore the community elders that make decisions on what to do with that. Uh, but it is just a different way of conserving uh, wildlife because the Samburu have been always excellent conservationists, and there is a conservation ethic in our culture where we believe that everything that's on this planet was put here by the supreme creator who also created us mm -hmm. and that each of them here is here for a purpose and uh, therefore deserves to exist just like we deserve to exist. Uh, but um, those of us who have gone to school and been exposed to different kinds of conservation from the traditional ones have come back with that conventional kind of um, uh, conservation and uh, sold that to our people. And uh, they have also embraced us because it is nothing new to them, uh, but it's just a different way of doing the same thing that uh, they have been doing. And now there is more value they see in wildlife in terms of getting uh, revenue that the tourists pay uh, to watch uh, the wildlife or do other activities out there. Uh, but that has enabled us to open up uh, lots of tracts of land uh, uh, for wildlife, lots of spaces. Uh, and because of the direct involvement of the community members, it has also enabled us to flush out uh, poachers uh, to the point that uh, in Samburu National Reserve, for example, we have not seen any case of poaching for years. Uh, so it is different, but at the same time, uh, the same because it is the conservation of the same species of animals because they use the whole ecosystem. Wow. I wanted to ask you about that, actually, that um, uh, the uh, conservation and the uh, anti-poaching uh, effort. So it sounds idyllic because you've involved the community. They're going to, as you say, flash out any... Uh, poachers who might be thinking that they can go into these areas and uh, poach a rhino, for example. How is it all communicate, uh, coordinated between the different uh, community conservations and the national park, etc.? Is there one body that, could, that co coordinates this? And what's the impact right now of no guests or very few uh, coming to help pay the bills? How, how is that whole anti-poaching effort being affected right now? All right, um, we coordinate between the game reserve and the community conservancies because we're basically taking care of the same animals. And uh, the research teams uh, map the roots of the different uh, species like gravy zebra, the elephants, and so on. And then um, we have one system of radio communication where within the game reserve we call uh, uh, rangers in the conservancies share information and in case of anything you know all of us work together to ensure that we sort out uh, that uh, issue um, where um, at the moment where there is um, uh, low traffic uh, low uh, tourist traffic and therefore low revenue 
Uh, the people still are committed to that conservation because it is already anyway in their uh, cultural ethic. Uh, and the rangers are getting on with their work. Uh, we have some donations from um, uh, serious uh, people who uh, value conservation. And uh, that is keeping them uh, going, uh, even without the revenue that um, uh, comes uh, to them. Uh, but we I always look at uh, ensuring that uh, these programs become ultimately self-sustaining. And that we do by ensuring that uh, every penny that we get is divided into two. 40% uh, is plowed back into the operations of the conservancies and 60% goes to some community projects such as healthcare and several others, uh, school fees and things like that. Uh, but yes, uh, we have um, donors that we work with, international conservation organizations that we work with, and even individual um, uh, tourists that come out here uh, get involved in conservation because they see that um, this is uh, the uh, foundation of the uh, tourism that we do, and they would like their children, grandchildren, uh, uh, generations to come, to still come and experience what they experience. So they would be, uh, they want to be part of that conservation story, and therefore, tourists that we've had for years still contribute to the conservation of uh, species out here, uh, just to keep that going. Right. That's very impressive, uh, Tom, I have to say, and congratulations to you and the community on uh, uh, setting up such a powerful organization to uh, combat uh, poaching. So uh, congratulations. I want to ask you. you about um, the spiritual side of the Samburu. I remember being out there on an earlier safari. Um, I'm a Mase, I'm an older gentleman, so I do have uh, a long history. And I remember going to a, a mountain that was described to me as very much part of the spiritual life of the Samburu. Ololokwi, I think, is the name, mm -hmm. right? Yep. What mm -hmm. explain to us the significance of Ololokwi and the spirituality of the Samburu people? Who is, who is the superior being for the Samburu people? All right. Um, yeah, the Samburu... Um very, very religious people, and they believe in a supreme being um, called Nkai. And uh, we believe that Nkai resides somewhere above all of us. We do not know exactly where, maybe beyond uh, the clouds, maybe beyond the moon, beyond the stars, but somewhere above all of us and is watching us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we believe that the Supreme Being is omnipresent, that's pre uh, present everywhere at the same time, and all-powerful, so he's seeing everything that we're, um, uh, we are doing. Uh, but Lololoque uh, stands very uh, special because it's just a massive rock that juts out of some flat land uh, and stands very tall uh, at about 6,000 uh, 230 um, meters, uh, and um, uh, it, um, it has a very big forest uh, that has a lot of water that flows from it, and the Samburu like doing their prayers and their sacrifices in serene places, and that uh, provides that serenity, and that's why uh, we go up there to do our prayers, to do our sacrifices uh, because it is a very tranquil place and uh, that is what um, people that come here who want to immerse themselves in the culture would do because women go up there sing songs in praise of their supreme being uh, the elders go chant some words but uh, you know the prayer for women is always song and um, women tourists can join them, go sing, and pray for whatever it is. Rain, when there's a prolonged drought, for example. Uh, and we do get that rain. But, um, you know, the essence of having prayers in a high place is because we feel that we are closer to our Supreme Being. Uh, and, of course, it's also a tranquil place. Well, Tom, uh, your Angai is obviously more cooperative than our Angai over here, because you may know we've had fires raging through mm -hmm. California 
Uh, and so mm -hmm. our guy, I don't know what he's doing. Maybe it's the same guy and he's looking after the Samburu and he'll come back to us. But uh, <laughs> when you say it's a holy place and the ladies do their prayers singing, you remind me of another uh, very special and uh, unique activity up in Samburu, and that's the singing wells. Tell us a little bit about the singing wells. Is it possible to see them? Is it possible for, 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 client, for guests to see them? And uh, what are they singing, if we're allowed to know? Are they praying? <laughs> All right. Um, yes, it is possible for guests to go out to the singing wells. Of course, the wells don't sing, but the people in the wells sing as they bail out water for their animals. You know, a young man goes into a well and bails uh, out several buckets uh, of water into a trough for all his father's livestock. And uh, the singing is simply uh, serves two purposes. Uh, purpose number one is to entertain oneself. And purpose number two is to entertain the animals and entice them to drink comfortably. Uh, uh, so th th that's the reason why those men who go into wells to bail out water for the animals uh, sing while they are in there. Wow. Uh, but it's also a prayer that, uh, you know, they pray to the Supreme Being that the water they give the animals uh, makes them healthy, that uh, after watering them, the grass that they are going to feed the animals uh, becomes uh, of sustenance to them. Uh, so that they can also get something in return, which is milk and every product that comes from their cattle. So wow. yes, it's possible to go and experience that. So thank you, Tom. So we're all the same, you know, people around the world. So American farmers here in the Midwest who have large herds of dairy cattle, they've been known, these hardy backwoodsmen, to sing gentle songs to their cows so that they produce milk. So we're all the same, uh, Tom. It's a, it's a charming story. And I know guests would be uh, delighted to go and actually observe uh, a singing well. Now, all good things, Tom, unfortunately have to come to an end. Um, so before we wrap up, you mentioned your uh, book you wrote of uh, Samburu Proverbs. Uh, I'd love us to finish this conversation, uh, for which, again, thank you so much. Uh, with a proverb, a suitable proverb, maybe one or two. Uh, so if you would please uh, recite a proverb, I don't know if you have your book with you or you've uh, committed them to memory, uh, but please recite a proverb that is in keeping with the times. You know, I have a proverb uh, that is suitable for all of us in the whole world uh, about the COVID problem that we are all experiencing. And uh, that proverb goes... Meata nalutu nemesh. That is, there is nothing that occurs that does not come to an end. So the COVID situation will come to an end. That's a, that's a lovely proverb. Uh, very nice, Tom, and uh, something for us to uh, remember. Uh, this too shall end. So um, uh, I think there's a similar expression uh, over here that uh, calamities don't last forever. Um, one last thing in the few minutes remaining, you touched on the fact that there's an elephant orphanage now run by the community, Reteti, I think you said it's called, up yep. in the north. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting because almost all our guests, as they go through Nairobi, visit the uh, Daphne Sheldrick uh, Elephant Orphanage in Nairobi. And to think, to think there's another one, because I remember... Uh, visiting the Daphne Sheldrick orphanage, that many of the little baby elephants there came from the north. What you're now saying is they don't need to do that and that the people, the Samburu people themselves, realize the importance of um, keeping their elephants to themselves so that they can share them in Samburu with visiting guests. Would you just enlarge on that as we close our conversation? Yes, um... It is um, the community that decided because we are getting droughts out here and uh, sometimes the mothers are too weak uh, to breastfeed their babies. Uh, 
you know, they end up ab uh, abandoning the babies, you know, sometimes um, uh, a mother is too sick to, um, to keep uh, taking care of the baby. And uh, we've always sent all those babies uh, to death in Sheldrick. But the community decided that uh, they have the capacity to take care of these baby elephants. And one very interesting thing is that they decided unanimously that women are better at taking care of babies than men. So uh, even these baby elephants should be taken care of by women. And the majority of the keepers in Retechi Elephant Sanctuary are actually women. And they do a fantastic job. And as they give those baby elephants milk, they sing the songs that they sing to their cattle when they give them water. And those babies are really soothed by that and enjoy the milk that they are given. Uh, so it is purely uh, out of concern by the community that uh, they started uh, that uh, sanctuary to ensure that um, they, uh, they take care of um, their baby elephants because it is their property, so to speak. Uh, and uh, we are headed there tomorrow and we're certainly going to enjoy ourselves there. Wow. Well, I think we can all attest, uh, Tom, and agree that uh, women make the best um, keepers and carers, if you like, um, uh, because, of course, they... Um, they're the ones that bring us all into the world and uh, they have good practice in it. So I can't disagree with that. So Tom, I want to thank you profusely for your time. You've been very generous with your time. I know it's late there in uh, your north of the equator. So you're actually in the same half of the world yep. I'm in with the equator running through Nairobi, mm -hmm. but it's late there, I know. So I appreciate you giving us all this time. I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Manyago and Annabella and uh, Peter is there and Daniel is there from Manyago who um, uh, uh, help us design our safaris and uh, uh, execute them and operate them so well. So we look forward to sending you more clients, more guests, uh, Tom, to your part of Kenya. Thank you very much. And if we can just go back to Annabella, I don't know if she's still there if she's around uh, to sign off. If not, uh, we can simply say uh, good night. Is she there or? She... Oh, hey, yes, she's there. Okay, let's just say good night. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Bona Jim, bye bye. Asante oh, sana. There's, there's, there's Peter. He's the managing director of Maniago Safaris. Lovely, thank you, Peter, for setting all this up with Annabella. Is thank, Annabella there? thank you, Jim, for everything. Thank you. There's Annabella. Mm -hmm. Annabella. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Bye bye, everybody. Just Jim. Bye. Okay, Daniel. Daniel Kwaheri. Thank you all very pleasure, much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, thank you. Keep it up. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you all very much. Kwaheri. Asante sana. Bye.